Happy Sabbath. I hope everybody's had a good week. I'm happy to see all the children that we have in this church. It's such a blessing. Um, and all the visitors that we have. Okay. We're going to begin today's announcements. So we have a Pathfinder meeting. Okay. I'm just going to wait for you guys to quiet down a little bit. Yes. Uh, it's, it's not just the Pathfinder, it's also it's for the adventurers. So if you're, if you're still, oh, uh, the meeting for tomorrow at TAA is not just the Pathfinders, it's also for the adventurers. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are planning on attending. Uh, but it's a, it's a great start. This is our first meeting, so if you're interested in, in coming out, all ages, adventurers and pathfinders, it starts at 2 o'clock uh, tomorrow at Tidewater Academy. Thank okay. You. Thank you. So tomorrow at 2 p.m. at the Tidewater Adventist Academy gym is the Adventurer and Pathfinder meeting. So next week, we have the JCOC, Judeo-Christian Outreach Center. This is a reminder that our church will be feeding the homeless on September 24th. Food and donations are needed. If you have any questions, please refer them to Elder Yadni or Sister Manaldo. Manalo. And this is actually a good time. Uh, during this past week's board meeting, Elder Yadney agreed to become the personal ministries director. So this is the first reading. So hope everybody's paying attention. So this is the first reading of Elder Yadney Etienne becoming the personal ministries director. So if you have any issues or concerns, please reach out to the pastor this week and then we'll have the second reading. In addition to that, Brother Ashil Kagabo also has been nominated by the board as the assistant personal ministries director to support Elder Yadni. And again, if you have any concerns, please reach out to the pastor. So this is the first reading for those names. We have many birthdays uh, this month. So if you see anybody on this list, Please reach out to them and say uh, happy birthday. It looks like Gerlaine's birthday was yesterday. Amen. 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 And Ovidio's birthday. Ovidio, how old are you? I don't see him. How old is he? Is he 11? Oh, wow. Our kids are getting 11. Okay, thank you, Ovidio. You're 11. I, I, I felt like the service we needed to know before we move on. Okay, and of course we have Emmanuel, who's actually somewhere as well. His, his birthday is this week, so please text him or call him. And uh, please uh, appreciate the fact that uh, we have so many people in this church and they have birthdays, and please reach out to them and help them to feel special. And of course we have happy anniversary to Suzette and Handel Noel. Amen. Amen. How many years? 17 years. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's good. So it is on Monday. Okay. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Sorry. I keep on forgetting. Today's set. Yeah. 17. Okay. I just turned 40. So be patient. Okay. So we have a notice. Now, if everybody looks around, does anybody notice we have lots of children in this church? And that is a blessing from the Lord. But I, but I always want to say that there is a responsibility with every blessing. And one of the responsibilities is making sure that you watch your children as they are going to the bathroom, as they are in the church, as they are outside running, that we are responsible for our children and making sure that they are doing what they're supposed to do. 
we, during the Sabbath school lesson, we were talking about Eli and his children and how he was responsible for his children. So how much more should we be responsible for our children in, in making sure that they're, they're on the right path? And then, of course, uh, COVID-19 is still with us. It's definitely not as much with us as it used to be. And so really the only important thing for us, and I think it's an important reminder, that if you do not feel well, if you feel a little bit under the weather, uh, please let us know so we can pray for you. But then also, you can stay home because guess what? We, our church is streamed via YouTube, and so you can catch your service or catch us at home. And uh, you can actually engage in the Sabbath school as well. Of course, we'd want everybody to be here in person as much as they can. But if you're, please, if you're not feeling well, uh, please stay home. Today's bulletin, you can use a QR code. Uh, you can actually use your smartphone. And what you can do is you can actually uh, scan the code. And you can have access to the church announcements, to the prayer request, online giving, and so many other things uh, that are available uh, to you. Okay, so we need to read these membership transfers. Uh, we have a first reading for Brother Joseph and Sister Jasmine, jo ja uh, Jasmine Thomas, and they are actually transferring from the Adventist Fellowship Church in Leesburg, Georgia. Okay, so this is a first reading, and then next Sabbath we'll have a second reading. So we have uh, two uh, individuals that want to join us. And for all of you that are visitors... And all of you that we know and we see regularly, please and thank you. Welcome to the Chesapeake Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're going to actually have praise and song. Hymn number 88 by Sister Lindsay Ikone. I sing the mighty power of God. Good morning and happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. It is good to see each of you here today. Um, we've had full weeks. Uh, any of you with children know that school has started for everyone. And um, if you don't have children, then you still get to slow down in the, in the um, school zone. So you're also aware. Um, but I praise God for bringing us through this week. And as we take this time for praise, I'm just going to remind you that this time we can just forget about whatever has been going on during the week. Um, and we can just focus on the goodness of God. So please join me as we sing, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Thy care. There's 
there's not a place where we can flee. But God is present there. You know, any of you that are from this area, I don't know how blessed, I don't know if you know how blessed you are. We moved here from Arizona a few years ago, and when we would look down at the ground, it was brown. And it wasn't, it was the desert. It didn't always look sandy, but it was, it was always brown. And uh, we said we want our children to be able to grow up to see more. I'm not going to say Arizona's not beautiful. Arizona has its beauty. But we want them to be able to enjoy it more. And I am so blessed every day. I wake up and I see it's green. It's green all year. And we're so blessed. Um, it just, it makes you feel like uh, singing. We don't always when we see it, but maybe we should. Let's also uh, sing, All That Thrills My Soul Is Jesus. Listen, listen to the words as, they're, as we sing this. Take it to heart, to your own heart. Crystal, yeah. As we, as we sing, you guys, I really want you to think about the goodness of God. Amen. The goodness of God. Amen. Yeah. Here right. on His holy Sabbath day. Yes, and here we are in verse four together. Yes. But By the crystal flowing river, with the ransom will I sing. Praise 
and glorify the King. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten Sabbath, I encourage you to find your 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 greatest joy, your greatest desire in God. Yes. Praise the yes. Lord. Please join me in the introit. You may stand. Father, thank you for this opportunity in which we can come together. We pray for your continued leading in our lives, Lord. And we pray that as we go throughout the service, Lord, our focus is upon you and how we can be drawn closer to you and your will for our lives, Lord. And I pray that this day, among all the days of the week, is an opportunity in which we can come together and worship you as a church family. And I pray that we don't leave here the same as when we came. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we have the hymn of worship, number 326, Open My, open my Eyes That I May See Jesus. Speak. 
of when I hear that I think of the the way this ties in so beautifully with our Sabbath school submitting our words what we hear that it might be the whole from the Holy Spirit so um, let's continue with the attitude of prayer I was looking for that slip of paper, but I believe I have it in here. Now is the time that we come together as a church family for praises and prayer requests. Um, this week, we're going to remember the Sister Bonnie Williams, and we're going to remember the You family. So please um, make sure that you uh, pray for them. Uh, Thomas, Elizabeth, Analia, and Sebastian uh, throughout your prayers uh, throughout the week. Um, there's usually a screen, but uh, there is uh, many people in our church, as you know, uh, that have prayer requests, um, and make sure that you keep them uh, in your thoughts and prayers. So at this time, do we have any prayer requests? Oh, there they are. You can see the prayer requests on the screen. Uh, for those that uh, are continually in need of prayer. Okay. Yes, Sister Amber. Uh, prayer of Thanksgiving. Thank you. Um, I found out this week that a new medication I have to be on costs $6,000 a month. Oh, wow. The insurance would cover all but two seventy-seven. Oh. And God gave me a grant for the rest. Oh, praise the Lord. So I'm going to be getting the help I need. For Amen. Free. Amen. Praise Amen. Lord. Amen. Oh. Okay. Any other prayer requests? My birthday was on Wednesday. Okay, praise the Lord for another year of life. Yes. Yes, I would like to add that this week uh, was a blessing for me and my family. Yesterday was uh, my wife's birthday and Wednesday was my son's birthday. So I praise God for that and please pray for my family as God continues to bless us. Yes. Any other prayer request, praises? Yes. I have a praise. Um, a friend of mine is uh, facing difficult times with her health. Okay. Uh, she was waiting for uh, crucial results, and she uh, got back them, and everything is good. So I want to say thank you to our Lord because he is good. Okay. Amen. Amen. Yes. Uh, Oh, video, but we'll wait for a microphone so we can hear you. Yeah, you can go ahead. Oh, video. On Friday was my birthday. Oh, wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And you're 11 now. Yes. Um, pray for my Pathfinder Club. Okay, yes, we should prepare for the Pathfinder Club. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
As you know, I'm still part of the TAA family over here. There's a couple of students that I would like to pray for. I'm not going to mention their names. Yes. But they have some challenges, and um, some of them are giving challenges to the teacher. Mm. And um, I just want to pray for the students over there that the teachers will be able to supply their needs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I was uh, handed a note earlier today. Uh, please pray for uh, Jay, Brother Jay, as he's going to be having a procedure soon. And then uh, Sister Jillian's uh, father-in-law as well. Yes, uh, Brother Thomas. Um, online we have uh, the Lomax family and Miss Ernestine for restoration uh, of health. Okay. Sister Ernestine for restoration of health. Yes, Brother Jaden. Um, my baby cousin was born on Wednesday. Oh, I have a new birth. Praise the Lord. Okay. Well, if you don't have any more praises or prayer requests, uh, let's get in. Let's bow our heads and get in the prayer position before the Lord. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this opportunity which we can come together and worship you together as a church family. We thank you for the birthdays, for the anniversaries, the little reminders that you bring before us in our lives of your grace that you've bestowed upon us. There are people that did not get to see another birthday this year or another anniversary, Lord. So help us not to take for granted and not appreciate the blessing of life that you've given upon us, Lord. We want to say a special prayer for how you've answered Sister Amber's prayer with regards to the medication, Lord, and we pray that it can help her and provide for her the comfort and peace that she's looking for. We want to say a special prayer for our young people in this church, how precious they are for us, and be with them as they're meeting tomorrow, the adventurers and the pathfinders, that they are drawn closer to you through those activities. We want to say a special prayer for those that are sick in the church, those that are dealing with illness, and we want to praise your name for restoration of health uh, that we are asking for. Lord, we want to say a special prayer for the TAA school, as there are many of our members and many of the people in the community, they send their children there. We want to say a special prayer and ask for your Holy Spirit to be with the leaders, with the teachers, with the staff, with all those involved in trying to show Christ to the young ones over there, and especially for the children that are having difficulties uh, during that time. Lord, I want to pray for the Chesapeake Church. You've blessed us so much with so many children, uh, so many people, so many families. And Lord, I uh, really believe that you have a great work for us to do in front uh, of us for the community. And uh, I pray that we do not take your blessings for granted, Lord, but we use them to bring the bless blessings to other people. <laughs> Lord, we want to pray for our special speaker that uh, is going to bring a message uh, to us. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit is with him as he's speaking. And Lord, we want to pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us in our hearts and our minds right now as we go throughout the rest of the service. That everything we do and say is to your highest glory and honor. And we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Okay. Next we have our tithe and offering. And so you can see the treasury summary. Um, just to, um, and something else came to my mind. So this treasurer summary was brought to us by Sister Heather Nelson. And so she has agreed to continue on as treasurer. And so I just want to bring that uh, to you as a church. So this is, again, the first reading. Uh, and if you have any concerns about Sister Heather's um, being in that position, please bring it to the pastor during the week. And you can see that the Lord has blessed us, that our offering is actually um, uh, more than um, our church budget. So we just pray that uh, you guys continue to uh, support the church and uh, the mission. And just a reminder for those that are not aware, the tithe does not actually stay in the local congregation. It goes up to the conference and it supports the pastors and the work throughout the union, the division, and throughout the world. And the offering is what's used in the church for the various ministries. There are four ways to give. The church website, the Adventist Giving app. Uh, of course, you have mail that you can use, uh, but please no cash, and we have the offering box. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we thank God for what he's given to us. Dear Holy Father, uh, this is an opportunity for us to say thank you for what you've provided for us, and we thank you that you provided us the strength to gain wealth and the wisdom to use that wealth for your glory and honor. And we just thank you for uh, working on uh, the hearts and minds of those here contributing. And Lord, I pray that you encourage those that aren't um, contributing to have faith and to be encouraged. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 And now we have the children's story by Sister Mary Lou Bauer. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? Good? All right. This morning, I want to talk to you about a, a, a gentleman. I think I'll call him Bill. Now, Bill owned a construction company, and he was very wealthy. He did very well at his work, and he found out that there was going to be a really big bid coming up. And this bid, boy, he worked hard on it. He did his best. And what it was for is they're going to be building a bridge and it was a very big job. And now Bill knew that if he could get this bid, that he would have enough money to last him for several years. So this was a really an important job. He had an appointment, and he went downtown, and he was going to meet with the man who was in charge of accepting the bids, the proposals. So. He got to the building. Um, oh, first he drove by the project, and he was thinking, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be really good, and I really, really want this bid. I want this. He got to the place. He got to the building, and he drove up, and he was just in his nice suit and tie, which was very unusual for him. He didn't normally wear a suit and tie. You would see him, and he'd just be in his jeans and T-shirt, and that was the way Bill always presented himself. But this was important, and he wanted to put his best foot forward. You've heard that before, haven't you? Put your best foot forward. That means that you make yourself look very presentable. So he got there, and he went into the building, and went to the elevator, pushed the button, and the Boy, the elevator just opened right up, and who walked out but Joe? Joe was his competitor. And Bill thought immediately, oh, Joe's already got his bid in. I wonder what he bid for this job, but I really, really want it. Gets up to the office, and he was sitting in the office and talking to the gentleman, and they were discussing how the project was going to go. 
So while they were sitting there, Bill, you know, he's just hoping and hoping, and he's thinking, well, I look pretty good, you know. And he seems very receptive to me. And all the while, his mind was really working, and he's thinking, I think this is good. I think he likes me. I think this is going to happen. But the phone rang, and the gentleman picked up the phone, and he said, oh, okay, all right. All right. So he put down the receiver and he said, Bill, I'm really sorry, but I have to um, go out of the office for just a minute. And he said, I won't be long, I promise. It might take me a couple minutes, though. So he, gets, he goes out the door and Bill's sitting there. And he, and he looks. And he looks and he's, he's looking over on the desk. And he sees on the desk that there is what looks like another proposal, and he realizes it's Joe's. Now he looks and he's thinking to himself, well, I'd really like to know what he bid on the job. I could just underbid him a little bit, and that would ensure that I get the job. And he's sitting there and he's waiting and his conscience is working, conscience is work, working, and he's thinking, I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't, but I think I'll just peek. So he peeks, and he's looking, and he sees, yep, that's Joe's bid, all right. And he looks over, and he sees everything that Joe's got, but he can't see the figures. He can't see them, and he goes, you know what? It's right under this pop can. And if I just move the pop can, I just pick it up, and so he's looking, and all of a sudden, he, he picks it up, and out rose, oh, no. And it made a nice, loud, clanging noise. Just then, the manager of the office comes walking in, and he sees on the floor are all the marbles that were in that can. And he said, Bill, I'm really sorry. We liked your work, and we thought that you would be the one for the job, but we can't trust you. So the lesson that we have to be thinking about is this. There's two things. Ecclesiastes 12.14 says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with everything whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, a man who will do something while he's all by himself, or a woman thinking no one will see, they don't fool God, do they? So the, really, the moral of this story is that the measure of someone's character is what they will do when they're all alone and thinking that no one can see. And then I'm going to read one more scripture for you, and this is from Psalm 33, and it's verses 13 through 15, and it says this, The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. So I want you to be thinking about that. Who are you when you are all by yourself, in your room, in your car, where no one can see you, you think, but God can see you, and he always knows. So think about that. Thank you. May all that has breath bless the name of our holy God. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. As usual, it is a pleasure to be worshiping in this sanctuary. My wife and I will be singing as an expression of gratitude to God for, first of all, including us, even us, in his plan of salvation and um, for blessing us as a couple. Tomorrow, we should be celebrating our 17th wedding anniversary, so we bless his holy name for all blessings received. Please. 
Scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 16 uh, through 19. Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 16 through 19. You can follow it on your Bible, or you can in the Bible, or you can follow it uh, on the screen. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16, starting from verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might 
by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, wait for it to follow, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So the next voice you're going to hear is from Elder David Dildy into the flood. He's joining us, our brother from the Redeeming Grace Fellowship SDA Church. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, man. I, I, I do, thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, you guys do bulletins on phones. That's why I messed up. I almost came up to do the scripture reading. Is this thing on? Let me see. I'm, okay. I'm going to go with the cordless now. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, I'm not good with technology. I am literally more comfortable with a black powder muzzle-loading rifle than I am with modern technology. So when you did bulletins on phones, it is almost guaranteed that I am going to make a mistake. So, uh, and I got lights on me, which I'm not, I feel like I'm in a Hollywood production. <laughs> I, I'd rather face an angry judge than some of this stuff. I, 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 I am an attorney, um, but you can still trust me. Um, it's, it's good to be here with you guys today. I, I want to talk about some pretty serious stuff. Um, so I want to start with a short word of prayer. All right. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your presence in this community. Thank you for every precious soul who is here this morning and those who are watching online. Um, your friend Job said, truly I spoke of things that are too great for me, and I feel very much the same. Um, and I ask that through the power of your spirit, you will help me, as your friend Job did, to speak of you what is right. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So is it okay if I move a little bit? Is it going to mess up the camera angles? I've got, I've got a face made for radio, so that's perfect. Okay, uh, if, if we can start the PowerPoint. Ah, there we go. I've got the power in my hand. Um, so... Before I was an attorney, I had a more honorable profession. I taught history. And I've got a master's in history, and I've read history all of my life. And I can tell you that in my considered opinion, the United States of America is more divided right now than it has been at any time since right before the Civil War. Um, oh, okay. Oh, well, I, I see that I'm among friends. You're agreeing with me. I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, um, the 1960s was a time of division, but there was a counterculture movement that was a decided minority in the country. It was loud, but it was a minority. Now the country is split. Um, we don't share the same values as Americans anymore. Um, and it's, it, 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 it's been a time of riot and protest cities burning, um, and a lot of people, even in newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, a columnist are talking about the possibility of a civil war. By the way, the talking about that lightly is kind of dumb. Wars are terrible, and anybody who thinks a civil war in this country would be a good thing doesn't, doesn't know war. The, the times we're living in remind me of something that the Puritan forefathers who founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony were very concerned about. If you don't know, Massachusetts Bay was founded as a, an openly religious colony. The purpose of the founders, the Puritan founders, was to create what they called a city on a hill, right? a godly community that people could look to to see how God wants his people to live. And the founders of that colony were very concerned about something they called declension. They built a lot of things into their legal system, into their voting system, to prevent the, the spirituality of the colony from, from declining, to make it so that if you were going to be a person who was involved in the life of the colony, you had to be a Christian. You had to be a church member. Um, Christianity as a force in America is declining big time. I anybody been to Europe? Anybody been in 
have been in European cathedrals, they're empty. Europe is a post-Christian culture, and we are getting there. And I want to talk about one of the reasons, well, uh, several reasons we're getting there, and then talk about how we should think about it. I also want to talk about the reality that we find ourselves in. There's a book by Benjamin Weicker called Ten Books That Screwed Up the World and Five More That Didn't Help. It's a fantastic book. It's a short read. I strongly recommend it if you are at all interested in this sort of thing. Weicker's thesis is that these books have really gone a long way towards shaping a public opinion and that the world we live in today is very much the result of these books. Now, you may be thinking, well, David, those are just books. Just books. Books aren't going to hurt anybody. Just before the French Revolution, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote a famous book. And speaking of that book, a Scottish writer named, Com named Thomas Carlyle said this. There was once a man called Rousseau who wrote a book containing nothing but ideas. The second edition of that book was bound in the skins of those who laughed at the first. Those ideas animated the, the French Revolution in which clergy and nobles were slaughtered. Ideas are important. And some of the books I'm going to mention you guys may have heard of. I'd be shocked if anybody in here has read all of them. I haven't read all of them. I've read some of them. Um, these books start up in the ivory tower of academia. They start in colleges and universities. And the ideas are taught to students. And just like these pages being tossed out of the tower in this picture, the ideas in these books filter down through the culture. And soon it becomes something that's thought about or believed by everybody. I'm going to run through the books real fast. The Prince by Machiavelli. Descartes' Discourse on Method, Hobbes, Leviathan, Rousseau, that, uh, that's the book I mentioned earlier, Discourse on the Origins and Foundations of Inequality Among Men. If you hear talk about equality today, um, they're, they're drawing on the work of Rousseau. Karl Marx, you've probably heard of the Communist Manifesto. John Stuart Mill, Utilitarianism. Charles Darwin, The Descent of Man. Actually, not the origin of the species, that's where he talked about evolution. That's a bad book, too. But in The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin posited some very nasty, vicious, racist ideas. Uh, Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil. Lenin, that's uh, Lenin of the, of the Russian Revolution, the, the State and Revolution. Sanger, The Pivot of Civilization. Hitler, Mein Kampf. Freud, Future of an Illusion. Mead, Coming of Age in Samoa. Michael Kinsley, Sexual Behavior in, in the uh, Human Male, and Betty Friedan, The Feminist Mystique. If you put all these books together, this is what you get. You get a worldview that is atheistic. You get a worldview that is materialistic. And that means that not, not just that there's no God, but that everything around us has a material ex explanation. It's got to be explainable by science or it's not a thing. You also get the ideas of moral relativism, which means there are no moral absolutes. There are no absolute rights and wrongs. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And the idea of sexual liberation, which is that in terms of sexuality, anything goes. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. These ideas didn't come out of nowhere. They came from these books. Um, and so, if you think about the institutions that drive culture in America, and guys, I'm, I'm, I'm not really going to talk a lot about politics. I'll talk a little bit about politics. But what you have to understand is this. Politics is downstream from culture. Americans spend a lot of time talking about politics. Each of you probably has, if you watch news, a favorite news station. And maybe Fox News, maybe CNN, it may be MSNBC, whatever. Talking about politics, it's interesting, it's got some utility, but guys, the bottom line is that these ideas would never have had a chance politically 100 years ago because the culture wouldn't have allowed it. Does that make sense? So 
Politics is downstream of changes in culture. And the problem is not in our political culture, although there are problems there. The problem is the culture itself. So as you think about the institutions that drive a culture in America, think about the news media. I think that's a big one. Think about the entertainment industry. That's a big one. Think about the educational system. And think about government. I think those four institutions do more than any other to drive opinion. And as you think about those institutions and then think about those values, would you agree with me that those values have pretty much captured all of those institutions? Is any one of those institutions going to step forward and say, no, we don't believe in materialism? No. Sexual liberation? No. Is any one of those institutions going to champion the idea of an absolute right and wrong? No. So understand where we're at, guys. The institutions, I'm missing a slide. That's horrible. Okay, sorry. I'll just talk. You, no pictures for this one, sorry. Um, the institutions that drive our culture have been captured by those values. I hate to even share this with you. And there's some stuff on here I can't, I, there's some stuff I want to tell you, but I can't because we're in a church. Boston Children's Hospital has performed, this is Boston Children's Hospital, has performed almost 200 double mastectomies on children aged 15 to 18 who want to make a gender transition. Now, um, under Virginia law, Someone who's 18 cannot enter into a contract because they lack capacity. They can't engage in sexual conduct because they lack the capacity. They can't vote because they lack the capacity. They can't own any property because they lack the capacity. And that's in every state. Boston Children's Hospital is performing double mastectomies on girls as young as 15 who believe they want to be men. In October, I'm sorry, an Oregon law from 2015 allows children to obtain, to obtain trans-affirming medical treatment without parental consent starting at age 15. So if you're an Oregon family and your child decides that they want to change genders, starting at age 15, you as a parent cannot stop them. A 2018 California statute does the same for children in foster care, but starting at age 12. I see a lot of young people in this church, which is actually a very, a very encouraging. Young people, uh, please do not take this wrong. Your brains, if you're the average girl, don't fully develop until you're around 23. Guys, you're dumber. Your average age is 26. Um, so we are letting children whose brains are not fully developed make life-altering decisions. And this is the one that just, it depresses me and blows me away. Yale. Not EVMS. Yale. Medical School's Children Pediatric Gender Program is helping children as young as three start on a gender journey. And even short of surgery, they are giving these children the same hormones to stop puberty coming on that they give to criminal defendants that they are sexually castrating, I'm, uh, chemically castrating, rather. And which of the institutions that drive culture, that drive opinion that we've talked about, is going to look at this and say, no, are you crazy? None of them is going to say that. In fact, if you say it's wrong, you're going to be attacked. Now, guys, I, I, I will say this. There's a right way to disagree with this, and there's a wrong way to disagree with it. The Bible says that God is what? Love. So everything we do has to be kind and respectful, 
has to be done in a loving, courteous way. And too often the church has reacted to things that are objectively really bad in ways that misrepresent what God is like. So we need to be careful about that. But this is the reality of the age that we live in. Now I want to talk about a little law. There's a statute that was passed back in the Clinton administration called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It's called RIFRA for short, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. What that statute did was create a a very high standard for the government if the government wanted to do anything that would hinder the free exercise of religion. And what the law says is that if the government wants to do anything that burdens the free exercise of anybody's religious beliefs, the government must have a compelling interest in whatever it is they're doing. Compelling means it's something the government's got to do. It's like a primary core function of government. It's got to be a compelling government interest. And what the government's doing has to be narrowly tailored so so that it doesn't have more of an impact than it has to, and and it's got to be the least restrictive thing the government can do to get done what it needs to get done. Is everybody with me? It's a very strong religious freedom protection. The House of Representatives um, in the last, I think it was last year, excuse me, passed what's called the Equality Act. What the Equality Act does, it, it does a couple of different things. What the Equality Act does is it takes issues of gender identity and sexual orientation outside the protection of RIFRA. All right? So if your free exercise of religion causes discrimination or disparate treatment, unequal treatment, to anyone who is homosexual or who has a different gender identity than their biological birth identity, then you don't get the protection of RIFRA anymore. Does that make sense? Is everybody with me? I'm being very technical. Okay. It does something else, too. The United States has a lengthy tradition of the government staying out of churches and ministers. The government... Courts historically will not get involved in what ministers churches select because that's inherently theological, right? What RIFRA does is narrow that exception substantially. Now, historically, courts have said when it comes to hiring pastors and when it comes to religious schools, hiring teachers, we're not going to get involved. Okay, that, that's, that still exists. But this Equality Act narrows the definition of minister and teacher so that it could produce this result. Let's imagine TAA wants to hire a secretary, a a receptionist to be out front. So they advertise the position. Transgender applicant applies, male to female. If TAA doesn't hire him because of his gender orientation, he can sue. That's what the Equality Act allows. Because he's not a teacher and he's not a minister. You got me? Christian school across the street. The Jewish yeshiva. The Muslim school. Everybody would be on the hook. Everybody would be at, at, at risk. And which of the institutions we talked about earlier are saying this is a bad idea? None of them. So I want to make my first main point to you guys. What you are doing here in this building, what's happening across the creek over there at TAA, these things have never been more important than they are right now. I'm deadly serious about that. Never in American history anyway is what we do in churches, and what we're doing in Christian schools has been more important than it is right now. Guys, I, because there are children in here, I can't even talk about 
the stuff that is in books in public high school libraries in Virginia Beach. There is some foul stuff there. There are teachers who share these values that we've been talking about. I'm not saying, look, I, I used to be one, one of those teachers. I used to joke that you could brand me with the scarlet P for being a public school teacher. Uh, and I think most of the teachers there are great people, they're great teachers, but there are a, there are an, there is an ever increasing number of them who don't share the values that you hold inside this building, that you hold in your lives. I, I'm not saying that to make you angry at them, I'm not saying that to make you go down and protest. I'm, I'm telling you that so you'll understand what's going on. There have been times in my life when I haven't been particular, ser particularly serious about my faith. It would be a good idea to get serious. It would be a good idea to get serious. You may be asking yourself, well, how did, I mean, okay, David, I get the thing about the books, but this stuff doesn't even make sense. Like, who... Why would someone at Yale, at Yale, think a three-year-old child can start on a gender journey? Paul wrote to Timothy, the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. And guys, I'm not saying that everybody who holds these values is completely beyond redemption. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I'm saying just the opposite. I'll get to that later. But when you ask yourself why, how, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrines. Instead, to suit their own desires... They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. There was a, uh, an atheist writer who, who converted to Christianity named G.K. Chesterton. And he said something that has a lot of explanatory power for me. And when I see something in the news and I think, how can they do that? This quote comes to mind, and it's like, yep, that's how they can do it. When men choose not to believe in God, they don't thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. That's why. That's why. If you abandon God... If you don't believe in God, if you won't listen to him, if you push him away, then you become capable of doing and saying and thinking and believing just about anything. Paul also wrote this to Timothy, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, and not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does that sound familiar? Our world today, how about verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power? Well... You guys realize who verse 5 is talking about, right? Church. It's not, yeah, it, it ain't talking about them. Church. It ain't talking about Yale's pediatric gender program. It ain't talking about the New York Times or the Washington Post. It's talking about the church. It's talking about us. You have a form of godliness, but you deny its power. What would a form of godliness look like? Let's talk about the Seventh-day Adventist context. What would a form of godliness look like? You sh oh, you show up to Sabbath school. Coming to church. You guys talk a lot. I like this. You, you, you pay your tithe. You keep the Sabbath. Eat the right things. Drink the right things. Don't eat or drink the wrong things. Is everybody with me? That's a form of godliness, right? That would also describe the people who crucified Jesus. 
and then said, break his legs because we got to get him down before the Sabbath. So, and I'm not saying those are bad things. And maybe, maybe one of the problems is that the way we've talked about God hope I don't say something that's going to get myself in trouble. Cor Cornell may come up here and grab me by the collar and frog march me out the back of the building. I'm, I'm going to say something that's a little radical, but I think it's true. We talk a lot about getting saved. God's goal is not to save you as you think about it. It's not the goal. The, the way we talk about a Christianity is we're in this condition, this sinful condition, and God's going to come and save us and change our status from in trouble with God to okay with God, and then we can go to heaven. That's not the goal. Ha ha. Hmm. Says they've got a form of godliness, but they deny the power of godliness. Romans 1. Now, when you think of God's power, what do you think of? It's creation. It's the Red Sea. It's the ten plagues. It's making the earth shake. It's Mount Sinai shaking and fire and... Yeah. Well, look at what Paul says in Romans 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And the, go and, and the word gospel means what? It's good news. I'm not ashamed of the good news because the good news is what? The power of God is the good news. God says, when I talk about my power, I don't define it in terms of being able to do stuff. Well, I'm, I'm going to go off my notes, which, which is always dangerous. When the teacher, well, you say that now. When the teacher of the law asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? What did he say? Yes, love, love, love God. That's the most important thing. Can love be compelled? It's got to be given voluntarily, right? Yes. If God's goal is to get us to love him, does his powerfulness help? Not really. If I've got someone who's all powerful, who can literally stuff me out like that, I'm, my first instinct is not going to be to love them. It's going to be what? It's going to be to be afraid of them. That's why, Jeremiah, that's why God told Jeremiah, let not the wise man boast of his strength, the rich man of his riches, or the wise man of his wisdom, but let him who boast, boast about this, that they know me and understand me, that I am the Lord. It's like Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, if you don't trust me because I'm a lawyer, sorry. Um, trust in who I am. If you're going to boast, boast that you know me and that you understand me. Because if you know God, and you, then you will trust him because God is love. And then you will let him transform you. Uh, the word that's translated salvation there comes from the Greek word sozos. Which means fully and completely healed. Healed. Restored to health. For in the gospel, verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed. What makes you trust somebody? What makes you trust somebody? Experience. Knowing them, experience. So the good news about God reveals who God is. Does that make sense? Yes. That's God's power. God says that is, that's what I stake my claim on. I could, I could make the ground shake if that would make you trust me. I'd rather just talk to you. Now check this out. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go off my slide again. Uh, uh, the scripture I had my friend here read is actually better. So I'm going to go off my PowerPoint slides and read that. Ephesians 3. Oh, let's see. We'll start... About verse 18. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he, God, may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And look at this next sentence. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Guys, do you know how much God loves you? I mean, do you really know? I, I, I maintain, I maintain this. I'm not preaching at you, because I don't do this. It's hard. It's the work of a lifetime. Um, if we really knew God, and if we really understood him, we would never be afraid of anything again. Never. Nothing would frighten me. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. If we understood how good he is, how much he loves us, how there's nothing that he won't do. In fact, well, that's too big of a segue. Another sermon maybe. Um, Keep reading. Verse 19, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, it doesn't even make sense, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Filled to the measure of the fullness of God. That's the goal. That's the goal. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen who? Where God wants to get us, guys, is, a pl- is to a point where someone says, if you want to know what Jesus is like, look at Lonnie. <clears throat> look at Ashley. Look at Cornell. Look at the Elliots. Look at Paul. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how... It would change your church if Jesus was actually here, walking around in it. Of course, he's one guy. Imagine how much it would change your church if... Maybe, (laughs) yeah, maybe that's God's plan. Maybe we've been focused on the wrong stuff. Check this out. I'm going to go back to my slide real quick because I want to make this point. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. Sounds like he's talking about the church. To to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may, may be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God... And become mature. The Greek word that is translated mature there is, it comes from the word teleo. Teleo can have several different meanings. Greek and Hebrew don't have nearly as many words as English. English has a billion words. Well, not a billion words. But it's got a lot, a lot of words. All right? And Hebrew and Greek don't have nearly as many words. And so words carry multiple meanings. Um, teleo can, can be translated mature, complete, whole, perfect. So God's goal here is to make us mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now check this out. Have you ever heard somebody in the church quote Jesus where he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect? You ever heard that? Now I don't know if this is still a thing, but when I was coming up in the Adventist church, there were people who talked about the fact that we have to achieve sinless perfection because of that scripture. Well, and let's look at it. You have heard that it was said, Matthew 5, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect. Teleo. Same word that was translated mature in Ephesians. Same word. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And how does Jesus define God's uh, perfection? 
loving your neighbor, loving your enemies. That's hard. Um, it's interesting that when Jesus talks about maturity, he talks about how we treat other people, particularly people who don't like us, particularly people who do bad things to us. Do you, do you see how maybe we've been talking about the wrong thing? Maybe we've been putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable? I'm not... I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be trying to get people into churches to make a decision to start to follow Jesus. And, and, I'll, and I'll go so far as to say this. The, the problem... Look, guys. When someone becomes saved, as we traditionally talk, uh, talk about it, God's attitude toward them doesn't change. It's their attitude toward God that changes. Paul says you were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. Why would you behaving badly make you think you're God's enemy? Because you think he's going to zap you, right? But when you get to know God, you understand that God's reaction to his enemies is what? Love. Love. So, what do we do? We're living in this, this world that's as messed up as it is. What do we do? When Israel encountered the Jordan as they were approaching Canaan, it was at flood stage. Now, the Jordan goes from being like this to being a creek on steroids, depending upon whether it's the wet season or the dry season. And as Israel approached the Jordan... It was the rainy season, and the river was, as you see it there. They couldn't really get across it. They could have gotten some men across it, maybe, but not women and children and a bunch of animals and supplies. God told Joshua to have the priests... Do you remember the story? He told him to have the priests take the Ark of the Covenant and go into the river. Now, what's in the ark? There's God's law, the Ten Commandments. There's Aaron's rod. And there's a jar of manna. That's what's in there. What does that represent? Well, in Jeremiah it says, I will write my law upon their heart. Right? Aaron's rod is a thing that was dead that God made alive. And the jar of manna re represents God's daily provision. You with me? Guys, the ark represents us. It represents us. What was above the ark in the most holy place? The Shekinah, God's presence. Where does God want to live? Inside your heart. Where, where does God want his law? Inside your heart. Who's God going to provide for every day? You. Who was dead and, and, and now God has made them alive? You. And look what happened. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went in front of them. And now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge... The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had, had completed the crossing on dry ground. What does that symbolize? I'll tell you what I think it symbolizes. Raging water in the Bible often symbolizes trouble. Israel is going to go where? Into the promised land. And they're right on the border and they're about to go in. If the ark does represent us, then what is God calling us to do? He is calling us to go into the raging waters. Into the trouble. Why? So we can get across? No. So that they can get across. 
Does that make sense? Those, God is calling us to stand in the gap for people. Even for these people who have these horrible, stupid, crazy ideas that are messing people up. God loves them. Ellen White writes that God's last message to a dying world is a message of his love. This takes courage. And guys, I, I, I want to be clear about something. I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying that our theology doesn't matter. I think it matters a lot. A theology is teaching about God and what we believe about God. It's going to drive how we view God and how we view God is going to drive uh, the way that we live. But our theology can be perfect and if we don't love people and if we're not being transformed. In fact, I will suggest that if you're the same person you were a year ago, you're not doing it right. I was talking to somebody and I, and I asked him, so are you, are you a better person? person or you would dip like if, if there was one thing in your life you could change oh, what would it be and they said well I might not cuss as much and I'm going well okay and I'm thinking okay well that's it's it's good not to use bad language but that's not the point yes. Yes. that's not the point be transformed by the renewing of your mind if you if you renew something what do you do you make it new right when we were new, when, when we came from God, uh, we were made in whose image? God's. And God is what? Love. So God's goal is to renew us so that if people say, if you want to know what God looks like, oh, just look at that guy. That's the goal. Theology is helpful to get there, but it's not the most important thing. Some of the best people I know go to church on the wrong day and eat horrible things. Some of the best people I know. Have I not commanded you, God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And as I get ready to wrap this thing up, I will tell you this. Speaking just from my personal experience, the enemy out there is not really the problem. It's this guy. Because I, I don't fully trust like I should. But God is loving and gracious, and he takes my screw-ups and makes something beautiful out of them, if I will let him. Um, and I don't want to leave you with a message of, of doom and gloom. Yeah, the culture is <laughs> terrible. It's terrible. It's awful. Um, my friend Paul Vidrell, <laughs> this photo is actually copyrighted, um, and I didn't tell him I was going to use it. I hope I don't get in trouble. Um, Paul, Paul took this picture, I think, in Colorado, and he said it, there was no moon, and he said it was the only night, and he's camped and hiked all over the place. He said it was the only night that he didn't need a light outside. He could see by starlight. So there was no moon, it was really dark. And in Daniel, speaking of the time of the end, when everything is dark, Daniel wrote this, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Amen. My friends, in this dark world, it is time for us to shine. Amen. Amen. Thank you. invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing song, I'd Rather Have Jesus. And as we think of all the things there are in the world, let us bring our minds back around to uh, Jesus. Red.
they'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. Jesus than worldwide fame I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of the vast domain or be held in sin Father, I pray that we, being rooted and established in your love, may have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is your love for us, and that we may be filled to the measure of all of your fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take a moment of silence.
Amen. Um, I want to welcome all of our visitors today, and I want to extend an invitation to potluck. Even if you didn't bring anything, please stay. Um, it's not so much about the food, but it's about the time together. And uh, I do pray uh, that you um, consider what Elder Dildy has brought to us today. Because I believe this is the message that needs to go out for these last days. Amen. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that those that are faithful to the Lord will be shining. And people will see the difference. So let's shine for Jesus today. Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful Sabbath and week.